Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jeff Slenor in Baltimore. In Japan Friday, Tokyo Electric Power Company is to begin removing more than 1,300 spent fuel rods from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Anti-nuclear activist Harvey Wasserman writes this is humankind's most dangerous moment since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now joining us to discuss this is Arjun Makajani. He's a nuclear and electrical engineer, president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Welcome back to The Real News Network, Dr. Makajani. Thanks very much for asking me back. So um, can you just describe or explain what TEPCO is doing right now at Fukushima and the dangers involved? Um, many people argue that this is, it's necessary to remove the fuel rods, but talk about the, the, the possible impact this could have. Well, every nuclear reactor uh, creates a lot of highly radioactive materials in the course of producing power. And when the fuel in the reactor is used up, it's called spent fuel, and it's put into these pools because it's very hot and has to be cooled by water or it may catch fire. And, of course, if it catches fire, it could create a pretty severe environmental damage and health damage. Um, now, the spent fuel pool number four at Fukushima, which is in question currently, um, has the most spent fuel of any of the damaged reactors. And the building itself is damaged. And if it is left there, there may be another earthquake. And if the spent fuel pool is destroyed in the next earthquake, uh, there could be a much more severe environmental catastrophe than there was in 2011 uh, in some ways, because the long-lived radioactive material in the spent fuel is more than uh, what was emitted during that accident. I'm talking about long-lived material, cesium, strontium, and so on. Uh, so I believe it is very important to empty spent fuel pool number four, especially, and put that spent fuel in safer storage. Look, there's no low-risk solution to this problem. Leaving it there is a significant risk, and removing it also involves significant risks. Um, the spent fuel um, may be difficult to dislodge because it's no longer in its proper original position. The fuel rods may break and the fuel may wind up at the bottom of the reactor, a spent fuel pool. Uh, there may be an accidental criticality. Uh, I haven't examined their plans in detail, but I do think it is very essential to remove this spent fuel because, in my judgment, the bigger danger is leaving it there and waiting for the earthquake to happen. Uh, it's unfortunate that TEPCO has not been a very good manager, it has mismanaged this accident. And I wish there had been more oversight, including international oversight, uh, before this step was taken. Uh, I personally do not know how, how good or adequate or inadequate these plans may be and how well they've understood exactly what they're doing. TEPCO doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, that's for sure, but I hope everything goes well tomorrow. And, um, you know, there's been growing concern, as you, as you mentioned, there's been many, many reasons to be worried about how TEPCO is, is handling this, and international uh, pressure is growing for the Japanese government to be more transparent, for TEPCO to be more transparent. What has been the international response, and do you think do you, do you think that TEPCO and the Japanese administration should be more transparent? Well, I think certainly they should be more transparent. They they have they initially welcomed some international involvement, but they closed up pretty um, quickly a few months after that. For instance, the French company Areva has offered them robotic technology to try to get at the molten fuel at the bottom of these reactors because there was a meltdown and that is a large part of the problem at Fukushima, removing that molten fuel so it's not contaminating the water and um, so radioactivity is prevented or at least minimized from entering the ocean. Uh, but they have refused this international cooperation at least so far. I don't know what has happened in the last couple of months, but at least until this summer, uh, there hadn't been cooperation on this front. I think the Japanese government has been more focused until this summer 
on reopening the shutdown reactors in Japan than on dealing with Fukushima, if one is to go by the number of public meetings they've held on Fukushima compared to the public meetings they held on reopening the reactors. So, so I don't think the, the, the Japanese government has been focused enough on this. So I think they are appropriating a lot of money, but, but this is a complicated problem. You know, there's a money component and there are a lot of technical oversight <laughs> components that need to be fulfilled. And unfortunately, we are in a situation where it's going to be a fingers crossed situation where you know where they need to where they need to do everything they can to make sure they don't have another serious problem to all. And and is it correct that something like this has never been attempted before? Um, it's never been attempted that to remove um, fuel rods from a severely damaged pool. No, so you know we've never had a situation where, for instance, the entire fuel handling structure of a reactor has been destroyed in an accident. That's what happened in March 2011. These pools are sitting high up in the building and above them, the cranes that move above the spent fuel pools and reactors that transfer fresh fuel into the reactor and use fuel out of the reactor into the pool. So these are pretty heavy uh, pieces of equipment and those cranes were destroyed uh, along, you know, with, with the building infrastructure on which on on which they were constructed. So they have to build a whole new, basically impromptu infrastructure to handle this spent fuel. That that one hopes that it is as precise as the other one, but but it's it's a, it's doubtful where whether it can replicate the precision of the old original crane which could go back and forth above the pool. Uh, but it is, you know, they have actually built some kind of a structure, protective structure, not like the original containment, but, and they also have built a new crane and remote handling for the fuel. So they have done a fair amount of work preparing to go up to tomorrow. Um, so, I don't think that one can one can say that they have been, you know, completely not on the job because, in my opinion, this is a job that that absolutely must be done along with the removal of the molten fuel at the bottom of the three reactors. And can you talk a little bit about the growing health concerns um, in Japan, in Fukushima, and especially among the workers that are um, trying to salvage the uh, the nuclear reactors? very concerned about the workers. I think among all people, including in Japan, and certainly here, the workers are by far the most affected. I think there many of them have received considerable radiation doses. They're working in very highly radioactive environments um, sometimes when they're close to these leaks, for example. The radiation doses near some of the leaks have been very, very high. Uh, they're basically using up the workers because they get their annual doses and you know, in tens of minutes or a few hours, and so they have to be replaced with new workers. Um, the morale of the workers, by all accounts, is, is not very good, and if you have to replace workers frequently, then their training isn't going to be, an experience isn't going to be the same as the workers who were there for a long time and really know the reactor. So, so I, I think the monitoring of the health of the workers should, in terms of health, be equal to the vigilance of monitoring of the health of the children downwind of Fukushima. I think those are the two most important populations to monitor, the, the Fukushima public, the children, and the workers. Of course, it's important to follow all of the others also who were downwind of Fukushima during the accident. But, but the workers are by far the most affected. And finally, um, there's been a lot of buzz in the internet about radioactive fish or radioactive matter hitting the west coast of uh, Canada and the U.S. Um, is this blown out of proportion or is this something that, that people should be concerned about, if not now, then in the near future? 
Well, I, I, I think there's no call. You know, it's not a panic type of situation. So if, if there are people who are panicking and talking about evacuations and so on on the West Coast, I think that that, that is all out of proportion. The uh, But at the same time, there is a real cause for concern because, as we know, there are hundreds of tons of radioactive water that are flowing into the ocean every day. Uh, while fishing in, near Fukushima is banned, um, you know, some fish do cross the ocean and that, that initially would get their food near the Fukushima site or off the coast, uh, east coast of Japan. And, and radioactivity of Fukushima origin has been detected at elevated levels. Um, the levels are not much different than the fallout created by nuclear weapons testing. Remember, everybody, especially in the northern hemisphere, has been living in a radioactively contaminated environment due to nuclear weapons testing. And we ingest the same materials in our food that have been put into the water and air by Fukushima, namely cesium-137, strontium-90, and others, actually, that were put, put into the environment by testing that are not in large amounts due to Fukushima, like plutonium and so on, carbon-14. The, the, I think that, every, yeah, it's important to remember that every little bit of radiation creates an increment of cancer risk. A small dose will create a small increment, a large dose will create a large increment. Now, if there are small doses in large populations, then you could get significant numbers of cancers even if the individual risk is low. Um, I think the U.S. Food and Drug Administration should be monitoring the food, fish especially, much more intensively and making those res results public, both because there is some physical concern and the, there is some stress among the population from not knowing. Remember, when you wait for the bus, the worst part is not knowing when it's going to come. So in a situation like this, which is more serious than waiting for the bus, uh, the worst part is not knowing when you're eating fish um, what kind of risk you are taking. Um, I would be careful, especially if I were a pregnant woman, about the provenance of my fish, you know, but the ocean is a vast dilution machine, and I think the measurements that have been made, for instance, by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute indicate two things, that the levels of radioactivity are you know, are larger than what can be explained by the initial accident, which means the accident is continuing to aggravate the environmental problem. And, and secondly, that the levels are not at, at alarming levels where, um, where panic is indicated, or panic is never indicated, it's never a good thing, but where serious levels of alarm are indicated about health in terms of very large numbers of cancers. That's not how I read the numbers. Um, the, you know, but there is a lack of information, and I think the EPA and FDA should be doing a better job of, of making the measurements and making them very easily available on the Internet. Thank you so much for joining us. Sure, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.